In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So, uh, God willing, we're going to continue studying the Ten Commandments um, that we've been speaking about for the past several weeks. Um, does anyone want to tell me what the Ten Commandments are in order? There's only ten. <laughs> Have no gods before me, that's one. That's not two, though. Do not make carved images. It's two. Keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath is uh, is the fourth one. No, mother and father is the fifth. Do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Yes. Okay, so you have worship no other gods. Do not make carved images. Do not um, take the name of the Lord in vain. And then keep the Sabbath day holy. Those are the first four. And we said the first four are, are governing what? Our relationship with God okay and then the remaining six are governing between people okay so what are the next six honor your father and mother it's number five do not kill okay that's six seven is adultery do not commit adultery do not steal so so yes after adultery do not steal and then Covet is the last one. Do not bear false witness. And what does bear false witness mean? Do not lie. Like, do not lie or, yes, slander, right? Okay, good. So we've been speaking about um, the uh, do not commit adultery, the seventh commandment, okay? Um, one way to avoid uh, adultery, so remember we said that adultery is not just adultery in the action, but it's also in the mind, right? And actually the Lord said uh, when he was teaching the people, he said in the Old Testament, Moses says, do not commit adultery, right? Meaning the physical act of adultery or fornication. But he is saying, do not even contemplate it in the mind. Do not like contemplate on lustful thoughts in the mind because everything that happens to us in thought is like the thought is the first step toward action. Right, so before a person doesn't just immediately go to committing a sin of action, but it starts out as a thought first, and then it grows to become an action. Okay, so um, the idea of maintaining purity in the Christian life is not just focusing on our actions, but but focusing on like the precursor of our actions, which could be our thoughts and our emotions. This is why we are called when we are confessing our sins, even the things that are not sin necessarily, like maybe. Let's say I'm being um, hounded with lustful thoughts, okay? And maybe these thoughts have not reached to the point of sin, meaning I haven't consented to them, I haven't, um, I haven't, you know, explored them. They're just thoughts that come to my mind. When we expose the thoughts or the feelings that we have, it helps to squash them, right, so that they stop. And once they stop, then they don't end up leading me into the act of sin, okay? Okay. So a big part of the thing that fuels the thoughts, right, is the images that we see, right? And so we, we are, obviously, we live in an era where it's very easy to consume images and video, right, all the time. Actually, for many people, they spend maybe eight hours a day or more just consuming images, right? Um, youth who, like, they spend so many hours on TikTok or s other social media, they just sit there programmed, to watch and consuming whatever it is that is given to them. Even when these images are in themselves not necessarily sinful images, but what we do is like we let down the door, and especially for these apps like TikTok where you're like not even controlling what you see, it's just kind of like one video after the next, after the next, like the algorithm decides for you what it is that you're gonna see. By, by, by getting used to this, it's kind of like saying, like, I'm opening the door and I'm letting somebody else decide what I am going to consume, right? What is it you're serving me? I'm going to eat it. Whatever you're giving me, I'm going to eat it. Like, when you go to a restaurant, instead of, like, ordering the food that you want, you just have them decide for you what you're going to eat. Whatever they put on your plate, whatever they give you, that's what you're going to eat, right? So the idea of being used to consuming images all the time 
and even like say music where we're like listening to music and hearing the lyrics of what the people are saying um it will over time reduce our ability to discern and reduce our ability to say no and close the door right you know like i heard this analogy of like like some say movies or tv shows or songs like music videos that have like all kinds of like very very bad images if people like that were to come to our door potentially and want to enter into our house we would probably say no i don't want these people in my house right like i i don't feel comfortable with these people entering into my house but we allow them into our minds by watching all of these images and movies and videos and like all these things right so children especially that are very susceptible to these images are growing up in a society where images are everywhere and especially when they have phones right they have access to those images 24 7 there's more like video content created like every second than you can consume in a lifetime like that's how much content there is on the internet there's no shortage ever will be of content right and and so it's very easy to be bombarded with images and then also sexual images specifically as well because our society is very sexualized um, and sex sells and they want everything to have to be attractive so they will include these kinds of things in um in very seemingly innocuous um otherwise innocuous shows um because it attracts people when children are bombarded with these images from a young age they become desensitized to them and then it becomes no longer something that will um, they will be sensitive to they, they will no longer be sensitive there's something wrong like at the very least even when someone falls into sin we should feel that there is something wrong with what we're doing right like at least i feel that there is a guilt associated with my act i did something i feel shame i feel guilt i feel like what i'm doing is wrong i i i don't want to justify it maybe then yeah even though i might fall into it but then i will confess it later but the the devil what he wants us to do is to be so exposed to all of these images to where we just think that this is normal life this is the normal um way that 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 society is that we are there's nothing wrong with it there's nothing wrong so so why why i will not confess i will i will actually keep consuming it more and more and more um our culture portrays that these images are normal and healthy i mean i don't know if you're aware of kind of like i don't know if it'd be called a movement or what um of the drag shows for kids are you have you heard about this so you know what drag shows are right drag shows are essentially men dressing up as women and and like doing lewd acts and dances and things like that um as a show okay they are now doing these in kindergartens and in young for schools for young kids and just last week in the news there was i think it was a high school student who like was on the stage and in a school and this drag queen this man dressed as a woman would come and do these perverted movements and things and lay, lay down on top of this girl okay which in a, in a sane era like maybe 20 years ago we would call this child abuse right but now we're calling it something else we're calling it um a healthy expression of sexuality whatever it is you want to call it right and so this is the the society that we're in now has brought things that are supposed to be like well, number one perverse but even natural and healthy sexuality which is holy have brought it to to be such like open and and available um and and and, and have perverted it in such a way to not make it be private between like a husband and a wife but to make it open and to make it like advertised in such a way to where children that grow up in this environment and seeing these things are going to think well what's wrong with this what's wrong with a man dressing as a woman and doing sexual dances in a school because they don't know any better right this is why we are called to as we were saying in the sermon that we should raise our kids through training and admonition right in the lord to 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 be vigilant and aware of these things happening like what is it that our kids are being exposed to and how should we respond to these things because it's very very essential otherwise children are confused and this is actually the reason why they're doing this they're doing it because they want to brainwash children so that as they get older they are pro trans and pro homosexuality pro all of these things right because at a young age they saw these images and it was very innocuous right like 
for them it's like, oh, this is safe in school. School is safe. And my teachers are consenting to this and, and everyone is having fun and laughing. So that means that this environment is good. That means these actions are good. So they're not going to, when you when you raise an alarm and you say, well, hey, this thing is bad, they're going to say, no, it's fine. It's good. What's wrong with it? You guys are just being too conservative, right? Um, yeah, many shows, especially for kids. And some shows, like even in Disney, like the, the main characters even are, are like homosexual, right? So they're trying to desensitize. And this is the thing with this idea of adultery, whether for kids or whether for adults or any kind of sexual kind of temptation, is when you become desensitized through images and through experiences, then it becomes less of, in, you, in your mind, it becomes not shameful anymore, but it becomes normal and natural. And that's when you let your guard down and more and more sin can enter. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the no, the, uh, so like definitely like parents watching TV shows with kids is a good thing. So you can point out the things that are wrong and, and kids already know like the thing, like maybe we kind of conservatively are kind of feel nervous to bring up these topics to our kids. Because we don't, we don't want to be the ones to like <laughs> remove their innocence from them. Talk about things that they might not know about, or we, we feel like like sexuality is something that we, sh you know, we, we feel uncomfortable having these direct, open conversations with our kids. But to be honest, we have to do so because they're already having all of these discussions with their friends, with their teachers, with they see it on 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 the screen, right? And so, if their initial impression or understanding or education about sexuality comes from the world then they're definitely going to get a perverted view of what is it that they are what is sexuality right like they're not going to they're going to understand it in a perverted way and they're going to think that's normal so one of our jobs in the church and as parents is to educate our kids early on it would be better for them to hear it from us first when they still have no idea what it is even at a very young age and that we present it in a healthy way we present it in a godly way and it doesn't have to be very explicit but to present it to them and say, this is what this is. And there are some people who believe contrary to God's word and they believe such and such. Like they believe two men can be married or they believe two women can be married or they believe a man can be a woman or a woman can become a man. What do you think about this? Do you think that this makes sense? And, and very naturally children are going to say, no, it doesn't make sense. Like they're just very naturally like ingrained in them. It doesn't make sense. You, you have to like brainwash yourself in order to accept the opposite of that because your senses and your just natural experience in the world tell you that that's, that's what makes sense. So definitely um, teaching our children from a young age is, is very important. Um, the, the one of the things about like the, the LGBT movement is the whole, their whole identity is in the sexuality. It's taking sexuality, which is something that God created to be good, and making that to be the defining factor of a person, like the defining characteristic of a person is their sexuality. So when someone says, I am gay, or I am lesbian, or I am whatever, right? Like you are de redefining who you are according to your sexual desires, right? So it is an idolatry of sexuality, right? Again, sexuality is good and God created it to be good, but not to elevate it to the level of I am, I, my whole being is just sexual. That's all I am. Well, what about everything else? What about, what about all the other characteristics that make up a human being? Why are you picking this one thing and you're making that everything about it is this, right? And, and so it is a kind of idolatry um, and an understanding that, and, and you hear this all the time, that they equate love with sexuality, right? You know, like you hear it's like, like love who you want. Like, like this is not about love, right? This is not love. This is selfish pleasure, right? This is not love. The, 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 the true Christian understanding of love is about sacrificing oneself for another person, not ingratiating oneself according to your lusts, right? Um, so, so definitely there is an obsession with sexuality in our culture, and that is reflected in the media, reflected in education system. I mean, even now, maybe again, you've heard in the news in many places um, 
where uh, ch teachers will encourage children to transition from being a boy to a girl or vice versa. And by law, they cannot even share this with the parents. So the, there are stories where parents don't even know this is happening. And then in school, they're calling their, like, let's say if it's a girl, they're calling her by a boy's name. She's using the boy's restroom. And parents don't even know that this is happening. And in some places that are more radical, like Canada, for instance, they will actually remove the child from the home, from the parent, if the parent is refusing this. If they find out and they reject this, th th there's actually a person who was in the news recently, they put him in jail, the father. They put him in jail. Um, because he rejected the idea of his, his child to transition, right? This is the world, right, that we live in now. And so it's very important for us to communicate with our children, to be present in their lives, to teach them what is right, and to teach them what is the proper place of sexuality, right? Because again, sexuality is good, but it's been perverted by, um, by the world. Sexuality is supposed to be expressed in privacy in the bonds of marriage, not advertised and exploited to attract attention, right? Sexuality is, is an intimate thing. Intimate. Intimate means it's, it's hidden. It's secret. It's between two people intimately, secretly, right? But now everything is exposed. Everything is like sexuality is just public for everyone to see. Um, this also, this verse, we read it today in the sermon, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. And I wonder how God is going to judge our society for all of the people who participate in this kinds of perversion to our, of our children and, 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 and harming them by desensitizing them to this and lying to them and deceiving them um, about this. Once a person is, is so exposed to this in this way, then it becomes very easy for them to fall into all kinds of addictions. Sexual addiction, pornography addiction, masturbation, all kinds of things that are very um, harmful to a person and, and, and become a source of like slavery to them where they are in bondage and unable to free themselves from, from this because they have been so introduced to these images and become obsessed with them. They are fixated on them. And it's not something, they don't understand it in, a, in its proper sense or in its proper way, right? Um, so, so exposure to unclean images and words is a big reason why people struggle with adultery, adultery of the mind and adultery in action. Um, Marriage after wrongful divorce. This is another source of adultery. Okay, In Matthew 5.32 it says, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. What does this mean? It means that once two people are married, God intends for this to be a permanent bond. Now, there are reasons why, why, where, where Christ said it is okay to separate and that's even why the church, whenever two people um, have chosen to separate, for whatever reason, we evaluate it and we say, can we grant to either of the two people permission to remarry again if there were legitimate reasons for the separation? Okay, But the standard that God created was that there is a union and that that union is unbroken. Okay, So that union... The, 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 the reason for that union and the purpose of that union is to create a godly home, to create stability in the home. To, because God gives certain gifts to the man and gives certain gifts to the woman, and they complement one another. And working together, in union together, they can provide what is best for their children. This is the intent. Now, in the broken world that we live in, a lot of times, this doesn't happen, right? And I'm not trying to say that if, if there is a marriage that's broken, it means that we can't raise our kids and that everything's going to be horrible. I'm not trying to say that. But I'm saying this is God's purpose. And this is why he makes divorce difficult. He doesn't want divorce to be easy. right? Again, there are reasons why God grants. So, for instance, he said if for the sake of a, uh, someone commits adultery, then there can be divorce. There can be a separation of the marriage, a breaking of the marriage, right? he says. But, but he doesn't want this to come easily right? because there is incentive to remain together. Yes. That's just the way that it was said, but the rule applies to both. 
yeah, the rule applies to both. We, we there's no difference in the treatment between a woman and a man. Either either way is the same. So I so I will I will address that but before I do so the the, ver the verse has two parts to it right and the first part it's talking about the woman committing adultery and the second part it's speaking about the man committing adultery but these are just two examples right like so he he's just taking two examples in one case he's using the man and woman one way and then the other one he's flipping it so it's the intent cuz see here in the beginning it says causes her to commit adultery and then the second half, it says, um, whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So that's referring to the man committing adultery. So it's not intended to be like, okay, this only applies to one gender or the other gender. But to your point, which I agree with, um, in the church, even, the society, the culture, oftentimes is that it places more stigma on a woman who has been divorced than on a man. And that's not right, okay? Because there is no... There is no difference, right? In the eyes of God, there is no difference. If it's something that's against God's command, it's against. So that's something that's not at the level of like the Bible teaching, but that's at the level of the community, right? And and that's not and that's something that we need to change. We don't we don't want to have that stigma to be unbalanced like that. There shouldn't be stigma one way or the other. I mean, I mean, the idea of of someone who is divorced, like it. The, the it's not it's 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 not like we look to people who are divorced and we mock them or we look down at them no they need healing and they need they need to be restored and they need to be you know they need to be served in the church and all of that just because god places a certain standard i mean god places a certain standard for all of us about everything right like he calls us to a life of sinlessness but all of us fall short of sinlessness right we fall short like when people fall into sin when they you know when they when they steal when they lie when they gossip when they do whatever the case might be we fall short of holiness that god is calling us for the idea of of having divorce is another is another case of that it's another case of we fall short it's not good okay but just because something is not good it doesn't mean that that person can no longer be a member of the church it doesn't mean that that person needs to be judged it doesn't mean that that person like has committed a sin far greater than any other sin no, every sin, of course, has its consequences and has its struggles, right? Um, which is why even in the church, those people who um, are divorced should be accepted. It doesn't mean that we defend the divorce or we promote divorce or we think divorce is like w w we're going to say, oh, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. But it doesn't mean that the people who, who struggle with it are rejected, Yeah, whether man or woman. Okay, what are some tips to avoid falling into adultery? The first is to escape. In Proverbs 6, it says, Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Meaning, meaning, don't think that you are stronger than, than you are. Right? Like, don't think that you're going to go to a certain thing or do a certain thing and that you are going to be strong enough to keep yourself from falling. Um, the, the perfect example of this is Joseph the Righteous because when he was, was um, solicited by Potiphar's wife, he didn't just say, no, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go into the other room. He, he fled completely. Like he, he completely fled because he didn't want to fall into the sin. Right? And so escaping right, is as much as maybe we feel like a humiliation, like if I have to run away from my enemy, Actually, this, this recognizes our own weakness. I am not able to stand, right? This is powerful temptations. I'm not able to stand. Let me flee. Let me run, um, run away. So escaping from tempting situations. 
um, escaping from thoughts. Second Corinthians 10.5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When we say we need to occupy our mind with prayer and meditation, reading, studying, thinking, and other productive tasks, when a person is idle, it's easy for their mind to stray and wander, which then can lead into all kinds of temptation. So this is why we are always wanting to keep ourselves busy, doing something useful, serving in some way, praying, like doing even like things like go and work out, go and spend time with friends. Don't give yourself the opportunity to just stay alone idly and then maybe fall into temptation and adulterous thoughts. Um, escaping the prevailing trends. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners. And this is a difficult one, especially for young people, because by, the, by their nature, they want to be accepted and they want to be part of a group right young people they want to be accepted and part of a group what group is it you know like in school for instance they see there because a group of kids and they want to be part of that group but that maybe that group is living by a set of values that is very contrary to what we believe but because of their desire for acceptance by that group they will do and say and be whatever they need to be in order to be part of that group right but more and more often now um, these types of groups Maybe you're very ungodly, and, and how is it that they speak, and what is it that they do, right? Here, King David is saying, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, right? So, again, going to training our children, and also for ourselves, don't allow ourselves to um, be part of groups of people who are going to lead us into sin, okay? And a big part of it is don't just accept whatever society accepts. Learn about it, understand it, and sadly, like we were talking about before, um, even things that we, we used to feel were innocuous, like Disney movies and other cartoons and things like that, are now filled with propaganda, filled intentionally. There was, uh, there was a leaked like Zoom meeting uh, of like some of the people that work on creating Disney movies. It was like an internal meeting that they had, um, like artists and writers and other people. Uh, and... Um, uh, the, the, they had this Zoom call and somehow this call got leaked to the media. And in this call, one of the people there who was lesbian, I believe, her whole job was how to include LGBT themes in the Disney content. That was her entire job. And she was speaking about how happy she was that Disney had given her the green light in order to do whatever it is that she wanted. Right? So you see, there is an agenda behind this. It is not just random there is, there is something behind it. So even when we talk about escaping evil environments, the most dangerous environment is the environment that I don't believe is threatening. right? Because if I believe something is threatening, then I will by my nature avoid it. But those things that we don't believe are threatening, that we allow ourselves to participate in, those are the most damaging because we let our guard down. Sadly now, we cannot let our guard down about anything, no matter what it is. Even like educational documentaries, um, no matter what it is. Like my daughter was watching this kid show on PBS and then just casually in the middle of the show, they had two women getting married, right? Like, like without, without even any commentary about it, it, it was just there. It was just like, this is normal. Like, this is of course, you know, why not? So, so everything has risks and we have to be aware of those risks. Escape from idleness. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all out overgrown with thorns, its surface was covered with nettles, its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Meaning, escape from idleness, escape from laziness, escape from seeking a life of just entertainment, because this is what a lot of people desire. This is their goal. They want to live a life of, of just casual leisure, right? People, we don't want to work. We want to retire early. We want to just travel and have fun and have enough money to do so. Um, but actually, what does that lead to? It leads to a life of idleness, a life of this leisure that can very easily make us to fall into sin. So, you know, maybe the fact that we have to get up early and we have to work and we have to do these things as much as we might not like it, maybe it's a blessing. Maybe God is actually protecting us from what it would be like to have a life where we didn't have anything to do. And all the only thing that we would do are what our hearts desire. 
maybe we would actually be led far, far away from God. The last point here I want to mention is drawing near to God. In 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay, So we are not just trying to avoid sin and running away from sin, but we have to run somewhere. Where are we going to run? We run toward God, meaning we are seeking God's presence. We are not just saying, I'm going to cut out the things that are, that are bad. We say, no, I want God to be in my life. And when God is in my life, then those things that are bad are not even going to be attractive to me. This is, the go- this is where we want to get. Not just that I'm like forcing myself against my will to avoid sin, but that sin becomes disgusting. Because if sin becomes disgusting, then avoiding sin is trivial. Avoiding sin is easy. It's like you don't go to after something that has a stench. You naturally avoid the stench. You don't have to like discipline yourself to avoid it. You just don't want it. So if we truly are conformed to the likeness of God and we hate the things that he hates and we love the things that he loves, then avoiding sin and avoiding adultery would be very, very easy for us. The problem is that because we are not sanctified as we should be, we have a desire for those things that are evil. So how is it that we work on ourselves? We run toward God. We seek God's presence. We seek to bring him into our life more and more, and he will help us and support us in our war. Call upon the assistance of the Holy Spirit to help us to fight. It's just because like the sin of adultery is associated with youth, um, just because... Um, youth tend to be the ones who, you know, their hormones are raging and this is something that they desire. And also, the youth tend to not have uh, a sense of the dangers of things, right? Like, they, they, they go after things believing that it is good, not realizing the kind of trouble that they bring upon themselves. Um, but definitely, this is something that affects all people, not, not just the young people. Any comments or questions before we conclude? Okay. Um, Of course, next two weeks, we're not going to have harvest meeting. Next week is the Hosanna Sunday. um, And then the week after that, of course, is the Feast of the Resurrection. But God willing, we will continue um, after that. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, O Lord, for this day. We ask for your blessing. We ask, O Lord, for your protection so that we do not fall into all the variety of sins that the devil seeks to make us to fall into. We ask, O Lord, for for you to guard us and protect us and to keep us safe and to sanctify our minds and to make us to love, O Lord, the things that you love and hate the things that you hate. We ask, O God, that you do not allow the devil to tempt us and to lead us astray from you and thus cause damage to ourselves and to our families and to our close relationships. But we ask, O God, that you save us from him. And that you protect us, O Lord, so that he does not come into war against our minds and our hearts and lead us into sin. Through the prayers of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. Paul, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of the only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the communion of the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.